Screen and to show you the more updated message. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, I already went. Um, okay. But for seminar, yeah. Uh, yeah, we are kind of sharing the recordings. Yeah. But there are also uh, additions they ask you to put to the introduction and uh, listen. I mean, usually they, they won't ask. Actually, I'm, I'm not even about it, so. <laughs> and then also, I put most people working on it, so. Yes. Yeah, hands up. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. so. Yeah. Yeah, I said that's the thing where it's actually not unusual. Uh -huh.
So hi everyone. Uh, so uh, Scott Winhang, he is a principal research scientist at Allen Institute uh, of for artificial intelligence. His research interests include uh, natural language processing, machine learning, and information retrieval. Uh, he received his PhD in computer science at uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, his work on joint inference using interlinear programming has been widely adopted in the NLP community for numerous factor prediction problems. Prior to joining AI2, uh, he has spent 12 years at Microsoft Research working on a variety of projects, uh, including email spam filtering, keyboard extraction and search, and advertisement relevance. His recent work focused on continuous representation and neural network models with applications in knowledge-based embedding, sending parsing, and question answering. Uh, he received his best paper award from Cornell uh, 2011, an outstanding paper award from ACL 2015, and has received uh, and has served as uh, area co chair, program co chair, and action associated editor in recent years. He is also a co presenter for several tutorials, of topics, including thematic volatility, deployment for AMP, and AMP for uh, precision medicine. So welcome on the Thank you and by me and mm -hmm. Today I'm gonna talk about Right. So um so my research interest uh, has always been natural and geography. But what does that mean really? So Essentially, the ultimate goal is that we can train or build a machine that the machine can uh, understand text either in books or understand whatever we um, tell the machine. But the interesting aspect is that um, to really show that the machine really understands something, and then we anticipate that you'll be able to answer um, our questions correctly. So this actually serves two purposes. One is that 
um, you essentially just use the question to test the intelligence of the machine. Uh, so in that case, you may already know the answers. Just just like as a teacher, you actually use the test to test the students whether they are. Another aspect is that you actually don't know the answer of the question, but as a user, you really are interested in the, in the information behind the question. So this is like a search scenario when you use search engine to do it. Um, um, query. Um, so question answering actually covers these two uh, sub uh, different aspects. So, um, but in general, you actually want to use this platform to communicate with the um, with the machine with the agent. So typically, the question answering setting is uh, what I call the single test. So you essentially ask a question and then so that's that's done. And then the next one is actually unrelated to the first one. Um, starting about like two years ago, we um, and my my colleague and I are actually thinking about no science say about this uh, marketing question, a conversational question on answering the question. Um, so for example, a user may ask who funded the AFL, and then the agent may give an answer, and then but he also knows that uh, maybe AFL itself could have some ambiguity. So he also kind of mentioned that um, it may mean uh, American Federation of Labor. But usually people love football and they don't love football in state. So um, in this case, um, so the user provides actual additional information and then so um, the agent actually correct that, but also mention another thing about uh, football. So in this case, um, the dialogue and conversation actually is useful in uh, getting more information from the user to um, to help you to disintegrate uh, potential um, you know, incomplete information. But there are also other aspects, for example, uh, um, yeah, after the user got interested in any watch, you actually more about that. Um, and then, I mean, from Seattle, so the uh, natural question will be like making it in the Northwest. Um, so the machine may actually not know its uh, concept, and then, um, so ideally, you should actually know that you know, it doesn't really know how to answer this question. And uh, in, in the meantime, use the chance to actually learn directly from the user. Um, so these are, um, as you, you can think of that as learning from interactions or uh, a machine teaching something like that. So there are actually a lot of different things that you can cover, to be covered in this conversational setting. Um, this is actually, of course, a, a, is a mock-up right? sample to show these kind of things. And to be honest, we are still very far from having a general solutions for enabling uh, this kind of conversational question answering dialogue. So, and uh, it, yeah, the system certainly knows how to not maybe ask too many questions. So I could see that if you say mm -hmm. Washington, Oregon, yeah. you say, well, which Washington, Washington State or Washington DC? And then, right. Uh, maybe annoy the user. Um, yeah, yeah so it depends on how intelligent your machine is, right? So there's mm -hmm. always, yeah, um, true. So there's also another aspect, like, just like, you don't, in the old times, speech recognition was actually bad. So you have to confirm yes or no all the time to. So there's also other user interface and GCI design issue over there. Okay, so um, so this talk I'm um, gonna present some of our recent work on um, kind of this thing of conversational question answering. And to be honest, we are actually just in the beginnings. Um, so in this case, I'm I kind of separate this into two parts. One is that uh, if we assume that our data source is a <coughs> excuse me. It's a structured uh, data source like uh, tables, and then usually we can use um, a semantic parsing, try to map the question into some kind of logic form or formal language, and then run that language, run that query on the structured uh, data source to get the answer. So I'm going to talk about um, the data set and also some of the um, recent model events um, in uh, actually general semantic parsing um, domain. And uh, later I'm gonna also talk about when um, we, the data source is actually on structured document. Um, so this setting is more like a, a popular reading comprehension setting. So, um, but we actually kind of make it a little conversational by um, providing more different things. And so i introduce briefly about the data set part and uh, also talk about a paper that is currently in submission. Um, about the model uh, for, for that kind of case. So the 
first part is really um, <coughs> so learning sequence parsers with indirect supervision and it's a uh, sequential question and source setting. So this uh, the first paper is actually um, the essay of uh, um, Chen Kim. Uh, so this was originally from what we are US internship for Wikimedia MSR back in uh, summer 2016. Okay, so um, the very motivation for that work is that uh, a lot of time in spatial instrument parsing community that in order to demonstrate or show that um, the machines are actually smart to actually understand very complicated questions. Um, so they will actually kind of present examples like this. Um, what is power of the superhero or is one of the most common home world and figured out um, uh, until like that. Okay, and then uh, in this case, trying to use this table as their source for explanation. Um, sure, this is very interesting, certainly challenging. Um, however, the question is that it's actually not really a natural way to uh, interact with the question answer system, if you think about that. So it's nice to actually really push the limit of the system, but this is just not how um, human computer communicate with the question. And even coming up with a slow question is, is actually not, not trivial. So, <clears throat> so most natural interaction would be actually asking um, a sequence of simple, simpler questions. Uh, for example, you may say, oh, who are the superheroes on Earth? And then the machine actually gives you a sign answer based on the table. And then you ask, who appeared after 2010? And then, and then um, what is her power and so on. So essentially, um, as humans are actually asking a low question, even though they have this intent, you probably naturally break it into simple questions and try to actually um, kind of have a more sequential dialogue while you can question as uh, while you can question answering set, uh, set, um, with the joint with the um, agent. Okay, so so in this paper we essentially propose this new task of sequential question answering data set and as, um, and also provide an initial model for some task. So. Um, before us, there's a, already a famous uh, data set uh, called Wiki table of questions from the past paper. Uh, so essentially, they have uh, prepared different tables from uh, Wikipedia and then uh, have purpose to actually write out questions and, then, and also uh, have answers. Essentially, the goal is to learn a submit parser, try to map the question to the main form, to, and then uh, run that against the table to get the answer. Um, so some of the questions there are actually pretty long and complicated. So we basically just reuse that data set, uh, um, especially the data part, and then took uh, a subset of the long questions in that data set, and that's our the user intent. And then we have purpose essentially saying that uh, given these long questions, trying to ask a sequence of simple questions, and essentially uh, the final question should also lead you to the answer to the original long question. So this is um, basically how we construct this data set, trying to break a uh, long question into a sequence of um, short questions. So to give you an example, um, so maybe the original intent is like um, the one shown on the slide, um, what superhero on Earth appeared most recently. And then the sequence of simple questions would be, okay, maybe the first one is just actually asking you know, uh, what are superheroes, and then, um, and then follow up questions basically So in this data we have uh, used already more than 2,000 low questions with the user intent. Um, and then uh, we have three annotators for each intent. Um, and then in the average, roughly, <coughs> have three questions for each statement. So the calculations of these are um, the size of the data set, size of the questions um, we have in the data set. So the we also provide a new approach in that paper. Um, so essentially, treating this as a semantic parsing problem, um, so tables are essentially just independent single um, table database. Then we want to make the question to a sort of query. In this case, I will just actually use a um, very simple format of a SQL-like query. So, so in general, the recipe here is that we'll define a formal query. Um, a significant parse language, and then we'll define the state action and state action transition. Uh, each action basically is just add a piece of um, statement or in this uh, structured language. And the runtime, we have to search for the basic end state, so essentially that's 
Um, each of this, um, just make it parse. Um, and then there's some learning method that you call. So that's the kind of high level idea. So just to be sure, sure I'm clear. Um, the state is your current semantic parse, like based on maybe the previous question, and the action is a, a modification of the existing parse to be the next. Is that the idea? Um, I just I, I wasn't quite clear about your section. Yeah, the so actually, they would be close to that, but it would be actually showing the powering up slide. So just the, showing what? Showing the powering up slide, yeah. <coughs> so, um, so that's basically just a kind of recipe. So let me just use a couple examples um, to describe what I'm doing here. So first of all, we have to define some kind of formal query language. Um, so in this case, because it's table, so it's natural to have something before that. Um, yeah. So, so in this particular case, you can see that um, when you have a question like that, it is essentially you can uh, hope that the final query will be like select character and then where the table, uh, where the condition is, and so on. And there's no form because we only talk about uh, just one. And the state actions is a state is really just a partial semantic parse. So um, that and the action here is really just add primitive statement to a partial state uh, semantic parse. Um, so in this case, we kind of separate it into um, different actions. For example, um, there's one, two, three, four, five. Essentially, each one of them is considered as a primitive um, statement. Um, so that's the uh, so each action is really just add something. Um, um, on top of that. And the state really just actually a sequence of actions uh, that you have already um, drawn. Okay, so, and then we have uh, some constraint like uh, uh, essentially with that given state, you know that there are um, subset of uh, actions that are just to the state. Um, example, like if you actually already use a select, then probably you won't um, choose another select uh, action. Um, so in the runtime, so forget about um, model training for a second. So assume you already have the model. On the runtime, then essentially what you want to do is uh, you have some function that to guide your search. And essentially your goal is really to follow this kind of state action definition and then eventually get to the end state that is uh, supposed to be um, a complete simple parse. So that's really what you're doing in um, runtime. So that's the search part. So for example, you can start from nothing, which is S0, and then the first step action is to select character, and then you move to the next step, and then you add condition and so on. Um, of course, it's a search problem, so which means that you actually have a lot of uh, state that is potentially completed. Um, so you need some kind of function to guide you to decide which one is the best. Um, so here we actually define this as um, each state is really just actually adding the um, um, the really the policy function. So given the state, then you can actually which one is actually what. And so the state function, the, the value of the state is really just uh, some of those um, um, policy functions, like the, the type function. Basically. Now, so that's really the model we, we need to learn. Um, so the value is really, um, so in this case, we actually use a numeric, it will help us define, uh, to learn the pi function. Um, so in this work, we use the idea of, uh, I think what's called uh, modular network idea. So essentially because we have different actions, so we essentially design different um, um, network architecture for uh, different action. So the idea is that, okay, if you have a select function, oh sorry, uh, select statement, and then this particular type of action will actually have the same network. And then if you have a condition one, then you have a, a particular network to actually handle this kind of things. Um, okay. So each one of them is depends on like which um, type of action you choose, then you will choose actually different network to look at um, and to provide this type of uh, value of this type of function. Okay. And these modules are actually selected dynamically as a, a search um, focus. So even in um, the training time, you actually kind of explore this kind of path. And then uh, depending on which action you're exploring, you actually just choose that network um, to, um, to construct the, uh, the final network to give you the, the high value. Um, 
And you can actually use kind of the intuition in design in time level. For example, uh, when you are doing this select column thing, um, the typical thing you have to decide is that, okay, so uh, I have a question, and then maybe some of the phrases in the question are actually linked to the column name. So uh, essentially, you just actually want to do some kind of you know, historical comparison compared to the text, um, some phrases, and also the uh, names of some columns over there. Now, um, let's talk about it if you're learning a little bit. Um, so in this case, case uh, we only have the indirect question, which means that we only have the answers to the question, but not the gene questions. So the, the algorithm here is that first we'll use some heuristic to help us to find the reference parser. So the reference is not guaranteed to be the correct parser, but it's basically um, the best semantic parts we can find that um, with the answers actually the same as the codons. But there's no guarantee that this semantic parts is correct. But that's probably the best we can say at this point. And then we use that, we'll treat that semantic parts as the ghost parts. And then uh, the next phase is that we're going to use our mod current model to um, you know, do the prediction. Um, and then we'll derive, compare these two semantic parts and then derive the ghost and try to update the ghost. Yes. So you don't have presumably semantic parses for your actual. Um, you, you do have reference parses. You have. We have the answers, but not the the, the ghost in the parse. So when you say find the reference, you're just finding a parse that evaluates the word. Basically, yes. Okay. Any parse. Okay. Yeah. So I get that now. Um, but uh, there are there are databases or uh, there are corpora of uh, yeah. national interests um, with uh, queries. So do you think you could use those? Uh, like the Wang and Mooney's work, but I mean, I think they use the existing corpus already, but like, I think Adis maybe has. Okay, so. you're making other domain. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is general, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it could be, yeah. Do you think that this is specialized enough that you want to, or maybe others are specialized enough? So you're basically you're saying that, sure, this data may not actually have so many parses, but there are other bases. Actually, I mean, there were enough to build an MT based approach, right? So, yeah. can, I'm not quite sure, though. I don't, I just don't. Yeah. Um, it could be, yeah. Uh, although, let me see. If you had that, let me ask you this way. If you had that with that, do you think that would improve? If you had a good database, could you just plug that in and read through things? If you have the full semantic process, you definitely will actually improve. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, whether that different domains actually can be transferred to this yeah. domain. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so one question is, do you have one reference for one sentence, or you can have several references? Because That's imaginary. A good okay. Yeah. So uh, I will go to that part. Uh, okay. Later. Another question is, could you not have that reference parse, but <laughs> just have a predictive parse and evaluate that and get lost from your answer? Um. You can do. You can do that. Yeah. Um, okay. But then, the reason why I mentioned this is that this is basically the algorithm we use, is mm -hmm. the, like margin based uh, algorithm. So, in some sense, it's kind of like well, perception. Right? So, you have the thing and you have the, the, the best thing for the current model, and you want to learn how to do your model essentially. So, so, that's the reason why we have that. Um, but if you only care about whether the answer is correct or not, and then essentially um, there'll be other algorithms as well. Um, I will talk about that in the second part of this talk. But Thanks. But so just to be clear, there's no additional granularity that you're getting by using a parse instead of the answer, right? So, so for the real answer, the granularity, yeah. there's no granularity, right? You just have an answer and you have no idea of kind of what. Right now we only have, have the answer. Right. When you get a parse, you still don't have any alignment between that and the computer. You don't have system. alignments. That's right. But you have more signals, right? So you can have some co-occurrences that. Okay. Okay. Right. So you, you have a you have a, a low dimension representation. Yeah, and to be, to be fair, uh, even even when people have the full label semantic parses uh, in their data sets, typically they don't have a line. <laughs> yeah, and also it's a bit tricky to define alignment in this case because it's not like synthetic parsing that each word you actually can have. You know, Say that this label or this phrase is, but sometimes the meaning comes to me is more like empty setting that you really just translate something to another thing. Yeah. Uh, so, 
while, 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 we read, while I was reading it, mm -hmm. I saw you mention that the annotators are required to annotate the answers in when where they are annotating, I mean, when they are deposing the complete, uh, complicated questions. Yeah. But uh, in that case, the answer must be the sales in the table, right? That's right. So you cannot do computation based on. So like uh, some, I think some questions may like, uh, what's the difference between two? So yes. that, but that would not be your answer. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so the language that we actually is not expressive enough to cover the question. Okay. Um, so, so let me just actually go, quickly go through this idea because uh, I still have a lot of things to, I want to say. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, in that, so for the reference, essentially, you can for now you just think that you know you have some heuristic, you use a search, and then you still you find the semi parts that gives you the, the either ideal case is that gives you the correct answer. The last ideal case is that it doesn't give you the correct answer, but it has significant overlap with the correct answer. So. In that case, we probably at this stage we can use that to guide our learning process. But the predict one, essentially, what it says here is that um, we want um, so the A star is the reference parts that you find. And we want that A star's um, value is greater than any of other CD parts you get. So essentially, it's like uh, you want the correct one, the reference one, has the highest value than any other uh, potential semi class you can find or create during the search process. And not only that, we want the difference between um, the difference between them actually is uh, um, kind of bigger than the difference of their reward function over here. And uh, this is really just the, the difference of the reward function is kind of the matching. And then if you actually just uh, move the right side to the left, and then essentially you can find those values. Essentially, like uh, I'm gonna find the most values in the parts using the same value. And then you can just direct the other two. So really high level idea is that you know like um, really like margin based per uh, perception or is any kind of idea is really difficult. Okay, so. Um, so finding the reference symmetric parts, the other case is that you have um, find the symmetric parts that gives you the um, correct answers. And in that case, you have one method. If not, then we use the Jacob coefficient to overlap uh, to measure the overlap. Um, so that would our coefficient. And then for the predict one, then as I said earlier, then every state states by the power constraint. Um, so you have the S star as the reference and the difference as the reward is as the uh, margin. And then in case you just actually just need to just find the most value in the in the parts and then do that. Um, so so that part is actually just for designed for just one question. So in order to actually extend to question sequence here, we actually just take a very uh, small step. So essentially what we define is that if this question is actually not the first question in the sequence, uh, then we have a different path or different possibility to, to create a parts. So for example, if it's the second question, it could be it could be that the question itself is still an independent question, or it could be that the question in order to answer the second question, you really have to know the answer of the uh, to the the first question. So in, in that case, we basically just say that okay, um, we have uh, some subsequent statement. So essentially means that you have to get answers from um, as the subset of the answer to the previous question. Um, so there are existing work on the wiki table questions at the time. So we just actually use them there. Um, and we try to modify the code to make them stronger. Um, so here is the answer accuracy that did. So um, for that, the point of the parsers I just mentioned, um, overall we got 44.7 accuracy, uh, which is better than the previous ones, but still not high enough. Um, and it goes also if you talk about the whole sequence accuracy, which means that you have to get points when you are able to actually answer all the questions in that sequence, and it's actually much lower. So essentially, we're still actually in the infant stage of doing this process. 
Um, and if you break down into like position one, position two, and not surprisingly, the first question is usually easier and then and then so we get better accuracy. But then because there is some error propagation and also fundamental recession motive and those power up questions and the accuracy usually drops. Yeah. I can imagine that um, I don't know exactly how the questions are structured, but that you could um, uh, have the case where like you get one of the questions wrong, but then you could, given that you got that question wrong, there is a correct answer. There's an answer that would be okay for position two, like say so you don't get double. I'm presumably you're just getting penalized. Absolutely. Gotcha. Um, a, do you, is that possible to restructure? And that's possible, but uh, a, the current evaluation may not be able to see that. So right, right, in right, that sure. case, it's kind of like for the second question, you actually get the semantic parts right. Yeah. But because you're based, you're running on the wrong position, right. then you get like. You can, oh, you can just run it on the correct table. You can run it. And that. then that would give you, you know, maybe a more that's picture. right. That's right. OK. Um, so we have time to say, I know that I'm going to see what the remaining channel is like. OK. Um, so that, that's that paper. And then, um, so some of the problems. First of all, is that in general, learning from denotation or answers only is difficult. So one, Problem people have identified is that there are many spurious problems. So essentially, that's related to the question that um, given the answer, there may be a lot of different possible ways to actually get that answer, and, and maybe only a very few of them are correct. Um, so, does that really affect how, how you learn that um, similar parts, um, whether we can get that? Um, and there's another thing is that there are many different learning methods. So we, the way we design the learning method is actually different from um, the, the algorithms that most people use, which we use based on marginal likelihood and reinforced error. So another question for us is that what's your relationship to other learning algorithms? So that basically motivates the, um, the you know, key paper that we're going to present uh, next week. Um, so this is actually from uh, written paper from uh, um, depends on this work um, and then some of my core uh, old colleagues work uh, at NSA. Although now I'm fine, it's actually the same time. Anyway, okay, so here's the setup of the learning from the notation. So remember that, so here let me introduce the notation a little bit. Um, so the text is really the question you get, um, and you want to make it to submit parts, which is actually why uh, it's our mini representation. And then uh, we are gonna actually run it on um, some structured data. Um, then we'll get an answer, um, which is uh, the O. So use the same example, like uh, the table questions in the example. So the question will be uh, X. Um, so we want to actually map it to the <coughs> mention where points is X. And then once we run that against the table, which is our environment, and then we'll get the answer. So that, that's basically what our system is. Um, so remember that we are still actually running using <coughs> the indirect operations, which means that we um, we don't have the code program, we don't have the code scheme. What we have is just the answer. And the problem is that um, if you have that, and then um, there are Actually, many different semantic parsers that can give you the same answer. So, all the uh, semantic parsers here, all the programs here, actually will give you the same answer. And uh, typically, in the learning setup, is that you have two steps. One is you still have some kind of search to help you to, say, to guess or at least to collect all the semantic parsers that can give you the full answer. So, that's the step one. Um, and step two is that once you have that, then of course you have some objective and then you actually update um, your model to actually uh, minimize your loss. So, you, so there's almost no exception that you have this, this kind of search. Now, um, in the search steps, the goal is actually to find the correct program and the uh, highest scoring and correct programs in general that essentially you want to um, Find the reference and find the incorrect binary pair of object that you know. um, But 
There are also several spurious programs that are actually give you the same go answer, but they are just actually symmetric. Right? Um, then the challenge is that if you know you can distinguish the correct program from the spurious programs, then you, essentially you should be um, able to do learning things. Um, so let's go over this uh, spurious programs program again. So the question here is what makes you score the most points? And for that particular table, uh, you can see that even though all these twenty parses will actually give you the same answer, but only one of them is semantic uh, correct. So what it means is that, um, for example, if you actually change your table uh, with the same question, all other semantic parses in red probably will not be able to actually give you the correct answer. And then for the second step, the opposite step, step is that you update the model using programs found by search. Um, and then uh, the challenge is really just make what's the best uh, strategy that you use um, to, to do the model learning. And then whether it actually is related to how many various projects you have, that's really um, important. Okay, so always begin the pipeline of the um, simply process of learning in the system is pretty wide. So you're given the question X, you have the answer Z, and then you have some doubt. The first one is that you do something search over programs while using the um, Python, using your current model. Um, and, and, uh, and also Z, which is the going to path um, to find a potential program set K. Um, so those K is usually like the, those programs actually um, give you the correct answer. So I actually look for the first person in the class. But once you have that, and then you will update from many parameters like uh, mixed classes, some of them coming out objective. And we'll talk about, and, and depending on the learning algorithm you use, then the update will be actually different. So the first step is that, okay, if the model actually selects a spurious program for update, and then there's, um, it increases the chance that you will select a spurious program in the future. So anyway, even if you can get away with that, it's that fundamental. So ideally, is that, you know, if you have any means to, to actually reduce the probability of selecting a bad one, then you should do it. So in this case, uh, we borrowed the idea of co um, policy shifting. So it's really just a fancy way to say that we're going to incorporate some by and large among this domain. Um, and then use that to change our uh, policy function. Um, yeah. So essentially, it means that, you know, um, you have a model which is P of psi, um, theta, um, um, given, sorry, P theta um, of Y given say, P in this case. And then uh, you have a critique policy, uh, Q function over here. And then the critique policy is actually kind of created somewhere else that you somehow know the domain more than just the, um, the model itself. And then you try to actually use that to, to change your, um, your policy function. So this is called the, the policy shift. So that means that when you actually do uh, the search and then we use the model, and then we actually use the um, shift policy instead of actually reviewing the model. So this is basically just saying that, okay, we're gonna insert our by knowledge of all this domain uh, in the search function over here. And what could be the, um, the by knowledge that we, we can use in this process? So um, the easiest one as I kind of hinted earlier is that a lot of time, even though you don't know the table, you know the question is asking about who has the most points. And if you know SQL, then it's very likely you're gonna kind of associate this um, most phrase or most word associated with um, you know, some kind of a conditional statement like our kind of maps, or you know, you, you know that fundamentally that should be highly likely to happen. Um, and, um, And also there are some uh, other things that you know, um, maybe you can check the um, question, some words, whether they actually kind of match um, some of the sales in the tables or the columns of that. So these are actually kind of um, straightforward heuristic that um, you know, know what it, it actually makes sense in a kind of general, so even though they are kind of heuristic to the same, you should probably consider doing them. And also you can, actually just actually look at the data to kind of learn these outputs. Um, so instead of just looking at one question one by one, you can actually look at all the questions uh, in the data 
let's say, and using your heuristic and then you can come up with a uh, potential or some hypothesis that you know, some of them may be spurious, sure. But you know, in this case, you guys see that the most and uh, um, maximum we probably actually co occur quite a lot. So, um, and then also point and point, they are actually kind of serviceable matching companies. So by just actually processing all the data, um, all the question and answer pairs, um, and the corresponding with the, all the uh, potential submit process we applied, then you can kind of create these kind of co-occurrence that you can use as prior touch to um, and then bias your, your model. So that's basically the first idea on uh, how we can do search by uh, leverage the idea of public the second, The second one is, okay, now, there are other different kind of learning algorithms. Is there any, uh, what other relationships? Right? Even, that, even though they are not the same, but it seems to us somehow they, they look very similar. So we actually want to dive in a little bit to study that. So, uh, so let's then look at what algorithms are there. So the first one is called maximum marginal length. This is probably the most popular algorithms. Um, it actually makes sense and it goes go very straightforward. So the idea is that uh, you're given a set of programs, K, bound by search, um, and you want to maximize the low functional levels. So the intuition here is that the K is the set of programs that gives you the correct answer. So you don't know which one of them is right, maybe, or you don't even know if any of them is correct. But there's no other information, so just assume that uh, they probably are correct, or I have to actually take the sample. So in that case, you will basically just boost the scores for all of them, even though uh, some of them are actually just spurious scores. So the, the way we did that is really just pretty straightforward. You look at net, it's essentially like um, you're gonna um, kind of break the equal choose the answer and the y is the possible here. And we know that the, um, basically once you have a submit process, you have the, you have the environment, you can, to um, execute that submit process or execute that program to get answer, uh, that answer <coughs> to go into. So you'll know that whether that's correct or not. So essentially, you can um, break it down to that. So that's basically makes my much more like. The second one is actually uh, quite popular in today's uh, screen course. Um, <coughs> the second is that you have a reward function associated with each submit parts um, that you find in, uh, in search. And then essentially, you want to. Uh, the expected reward of that by doing something. Um, the third method is actually our method called the maximum marginal, um, sorry, maximum margin reward uh, method that I talked earlier, talked about earlier. So this is really just a branch of that. The fourth one is the base version or the kind of revised version of our um, margin based method. So essentially, in the original margin based method, we just like the search, I will find only um, the, the most violent predicted submit process. So we just use that one to compare the model to that one. Here is that you know, we basically just count all the um, candidate submit process we found in our search. Then we essentially just uh, use all of them, all of them and we discount all of them. So it's kind of the average, average version of that. Okay. So all these methods, if we write it down and then we derive the gradient, uh, then we can basically try and make them look pretty similar. So these are the kind of the gradients we actually derive um, against the objective of those functions. Okay. And then the interesting thing is that now you can see that there are kind of like two different styles of not to for it, and they all are not the same. So essentially what is two things that if you actually change it and exactly becomes a, a different app. So the first one, um, so, so because of that we kind of derive a, what we call a generalized uh, update equation. So there's a graphical term here and the graphical term. We call the first term kind of intensity, the second term is kind of distribution. distribution. Um, and essentially now you can see that all these algorithms are actually kind of facial case of this kind of equation <coughs> that the um, um, Sure, that, that kind of 
it's interesting back then for you. Um, but really, what um, what you know, why is it useful, or why is it actually you know, how how does that actually uh, help us? So there are a couple of things we can do. One is that you know, by looking at that, you know, maybe you can get some sense of how the behaviors of an algorithm is different. Uh, for example, if you look at this equation and you uh, compare it to the previous um, model, which is the uh, average Hodgkin reward algorithm, then we'll know that the actual time update compared to any error, which basically you can actually do, um, you predict to every one of them that's uh, in the bin. Um, so this basically means that you know if you you know, if the severest problem problem in your particular task area, say it's actually not that severe, then doing this kind of high latency update probably will help help you more. Um, but again, if there are actually a lot of severe programs, then then probably this will hurt you. Um, so that's one way that you can actually look at different algorithms from you know with a new perspective or from a different perspective. And another thing is that potentially you can create a new an algorithm by just you know. Uh, Either changing these two terms, or even have some kind of parameter formed to, um, you know, use gradient descent to update these two um, terms as well. We haven't tried that, but let's just idea that it basically opens um, kind of direction and the door to to actually invest in um, different learning algorithms. Okay, um, so this definitely helped us. Otherwise, we'll we won't be able to publish your paper. <laughs> uh, so using this new method, and then with this kind of study, we push uh, the numbers on the good data set uh, it, uh, with RT shipping and also these new learning methods for that first data, uh, was about five points. Was one of these the, the number from their first paper? No, uh, 44.7 is the, the... Oh, sorry, uh, well, yeah, that's your previous Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's the first part of the talk about some pricing and using table. Uh, I have a little bit of time uh, left, and then I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about the new data set track and also uh, the model idea for kind of solving this kind of conversation on using tasks. I want to mention that this is actually joint work of, uh, with a lot of people uh, for Quark. Um, I think, uh, also, uh, Moki Ayu and Moki Esther, they are really uh, the driving force. Um, for other senior people, are just like there and probably give comments and <laughs> have writing paper. Um, and uh, for QA, is actually from uh, an intern project that uh, I just, just finished and we uh, just submitted, well, submit paper to some conference. Uh, that is on <laughs> okay, right now. Okay. Um, so the, the term written submission the, of the task of Machine reading actually is pretty popular um, these years. So essentially, the setup is that you don't longer have a database or a data table. You have a piece of contents, uh, some documents from Wikipedia, from your school writer. And you have a general question. Uh, and then uh, the audio motivation is that to test whether the machine actually understands it. So you post that question, and hopefully, the machine gives some answer that you can write. So in this kind of test, that you can also imagine some kind of conversational set. Then, um, for example, you ask about the football game that has USC on the last weekend, and then the computer actually gives you some result. But then you ask follow up, which, you know, which team was leading at half time. Uh, if the audio is set up, if you actually use any of the existing um, written communication system, you probably will not be able to answer the question. This person really know when to which team leading. So you they actually would have to create this question. Um, this can also basically all questions have to uh, jump on the table. Um, so there are different kinds of context. Who is asking the question? Uh, for the, what was he talking about previously? Um, and uh, if you use that kind of thing, criteria to look at uh, the existing data set. So even though there are already tons of reading computation question data set, Question answering data set available nowadays. Um, really, most of the question or most of the data set actually just can handle the single term um, setting. And the only exception I know of is Coca. Uh, I think Steve already just actually 
came together a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the video had to be very happy, but I didn't need to actually publish the video. Anyway, um, so there are different aspects of uh, you know, this kind of benefits, uh, whether it's large scale or what kind of linguistic challenges or what kind of natural uh, interaction you can have in between the shape. So the data set we propose is question answering context arc. Um, basically, um, it's a large data set. Um, it has um, the linguistic challenges actually include the data of history and core reference. Um, it has follow up questions, so it's a, a, it's a more natural interaction. And the, we kind of strategically choose to use stand as the evaluation. So essentially, we hope that you know, because it's why it's so popular, so you can actually um, you know, already have some other constraint and then it will be easy for people to actually use their model um, to, um, you know, to run on, on our data set. So, um, so the data set, the data correction process, again, we use Kirkus, but in this case, it's a bit tricky because we really want to encourage more or mimic the real um, dialogue conversation. So, so in this case, we basically um, pair two characters. One plays the role as teacher, and the other plays the role as the student. So the instructions to the student is that the student will actually see the uh, title of the article, and they will see the first sentence of the article. So the student will actually get some sense on the topic that he is instructed to um, ask about. But he doesn't really know um, the full things about the topic. And he, doesn't, he doesn't really see the topic. Um, so the instruction really is, is kind of open-ended. We just say that you know you try to ask questions to learn as much as possible about this particular topic. So uh, this setup is more like you know imagine that you want to understand some topic and you use a search engine. So you could actually ask some kind of follow-up question and then you may come up with a question based on the result you get from the search engine. Um, for the teacher part, and the teacher actually has the access of the uh, document. Um, so you will, the teacher will answer the question by choosing stand or simply say that you know I cannot really answer the question based on the topic. Um, to actually encourage the conversation to go uh, more smoother, then the teacher is also interrupted with some kind of feedback information like okay maybe you should um, follow up on this topic or maybe it's okay to follow up but it, um, yeah or maybe we should say that. It's really not much interesting on this thread, so don't follow up. So really trying to actually uh, guide the student a little bit on the question, the follow-up question that um, the student can ask. And of course, and, and also sometimes, uh, well, not just main question, maybe yes, no question is also kind of important. So in the end, we have about 14,000 dialogues. Um, and each dialogue actually has like a 7.2 characters on the average. Um, some of the analysis on the data set in terms of questions, uh, 50, around 50% of the questions are actually straightforward questions, but uh, the other half is uh, not really quite straightforward, so we want to find more how to do more on the aspect. Um, there are about 20% of the questions are actually not answerable. Um, yeah, you know, they are fair questions, this back to the document doesn't provide enough. Uh, evidence to support the answers to the question. Um, about 60% of them actually uh, drop some kind of problem related to the issue of the grid. Uh, and then 40% actually are correct uh, to the uh, dialogue question. So it's basically you know, based on previous answer or previous question. Um, and in terms of the analysis on the conversation of history, um, some of other questions early in the dialogue are different from that of the end, or, or and also other questions related to previous questions. So we did some analysis over here. Um, so this graphic essentially just actually show that once um, as the conversation progresses, where behavior actually changes, for example, whether there are more is no question or less if it's no question, or um, you know, trying to actually observe whether the um, the questions that your student asks will actually change. So the, the the general takeaway is that question is become harder to answer as the dialogue progresses. Um, 
And then even though there are some kind of you know, dependencies, um, right, and to be able to answer this question, you probably actually have to understand the history. These kind of dependencies mostly are actually still kind of local. So the information that you need to answer the current question most likely is actually in this, uh, you know, uh, the previous intermediate questions. Um, there are some cases that you actually have to trace back to a, a, you know, a question that asks. Um, maybe the theme, but that's a very true. So uh, as I said, we kind of follow the box settings. So this is same um, as the answer. So naturally, we actually use the checkpoint score as the input. The weak code really depends on um, the words in the prediction, the words in the um, reference. Um, in addition to that, we also invented a, a new direction matrix. So this is hopefully to give you some guidance of like, OK, um, the, how good the current answer is. Is it, have, is it already kind of reached human level or is it still not? So it's basically saying that we have five characters and then you can compute the, um, the point score of each um, character using your remaining um, character tables as the goal uh, answer. And so you can come up with the point score of this uh, human performance. And what we say is that if your model score actually Model and points to actually reach human performance, and then we say that they probably already uh, reached the human target on this particular condition. If not, then they will be still low. So, this is uh, another indication to kind of give you a sense like, okay, how far are you going to see, assuming that human performance is already good enough. So, um, so, in some sense, this is a kind of extension of the traditional uh, reading combination task. Um, so, uh, a natural way is let's find some way to extend the current um, reading combination model to actually apply that to this current conversational reading model. So, the, the existing current um, reading combination model can be roughly described as this. Um, right? So, you have a question and then the context. Context is actually your document. Um, and your goal is actually to find to extend your context to the document. So essentially what you want to do at the end, at the end of the day is that you're gonna predict the beginning position in your document and also the end position in your document. And then you know, somewhere between the beginning and end position, that's your span, that's your answer. Yeah. And the question here is actually trying to help you to do that. So the existing current model, roughly speaking, is that they have many layers, and then for each layer, you have to actually use the question information as some kind of attention to uh, compare to um, the vectors in your context <coughs> right, over here. Right. So, and then you kind of push it up. Uh, so this attention and go up, and then you can have another attention and so on. So that's basically um, all the. differences over there, but that's basically, that's just the basic idea. Um, so in the talk paper, um, so we, the baseline we try is we, we extend the, the, the five-day model. Um, so we have some improvement. Uh, first is that we also encode the question term in the journey. And then um, we have a simple way to actually encode the history. So essentially is that you know, if you are trying to answer this question, we'll mark Previous answers in in the document to say that okay, so we have additional information coded in a very cool way, saying that you know this part, this span is actually the answer for this question. Yeah, use as input to the current question, and of course we use the uh, you know the famous Elmo contextual word in any word from uh, back there too. Um, that actually also includes the model that that we need. So it's a uh, it's not the base performance system. So the blue uh, point is actually project uh, just finished. Uh, so the model is called flow theory. So the basic idea is uh, well, it's actually also conceptually simple and then potentially applicable to any kind of um, reading convention system. So the idea is that you know uh, now you know all you 
did not just have one network to handle one question. So if you actually think about that, uh, you're dealing with a question sequence, and then um, you have different layers. That each layer is actually handling um, different questions in your question sequence. So the main idea here is that we want not just to actually kind of use instant marker idea, we actually also want to test all the network computation in each uh, question to um, the next question. So really the idea here is that for each token in the context of this document, essentially you can imagine that we have a different iron on that table. So it's like for the first token in the document, um, in the first question, that's the first token, and then the same token in the document, but for the second question, you know, that's the token. It's the second token in this kind of RN structure. So it's kind of like you have an RN alone uh, for each to context token, and then alone the question sequence. So that's basically the idea um, how we actually incorporate all these kind of um, we extend or do we use the existing um, reading combination model that but add another layer to chain all these kind of internal processing layer um, of all the questions and you know that belong to the same conversation. Okay. Um, and here's the result. So um, you can say one. So the current score is one produced by that and one. And then using this whole idea, we boost it a little bit to the six point five. And by looking at the uh, human performance score, then we see that um, sure we also improve, but there is still actually quite a lot gap compared to the current this um, you know, system performance to the activity. Okay, so um, in conclusion, so I talked about conversational running during the question answering. Um, so I believe it's a more natural form for human machine interaction. Um, it, it's also interesting because it introduces uh, many different risk challenges and complexities. Um, we provide new data sets um, for both historical data um, information source and also the unstructured document as information source. Um, so I quickly talk, I mostly talked about the first part, quickly talk about the second part. Um, and because this is really just the beginning, uh, so we still actually far from solving this problem. Um, um, there are you know, many different interesting open problems, you know, like how to better model the contextual information in the visual history. And um, um, so we right now only kind of handle the sequential part, but there are actually much more uh, kind of richer and more interesting uh, possible interactions in the real conversational system. Like uh, when can the computer actually ask uh, some questions to actually help this data to give the, the original question or you know, how can the machine actually use the chance to being able to uh, regular users, not just actually machine learning designers, teach the, the system how to work online. Um, and also we have to mention that the uh, evaluation and learning part here is really still in the static setting. So in the, in the real conversational setting, like once you give the wrong answer, then, then you potentially get the other different uh, machines or even if you get the same answer, uh, different time you get probably different kind of power of power questions. So these kind of dynamic things we certainly are not handling right now. And the data set creation is kind of providing a snapshot of one particular path in the whole a lot of possible paths. Um, so in the real kind of evaluation, like we really have a human in the loop, that part of the evaluation and learning actually has not to be done for these kind of tasks. Um, so I don't I think I'm a little bit over time, so I can stop here and then uh, take the question. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, we haven't really tried.
QA's model, like one or two slides ago, we're explaining what was different about that compared to the baseline you guys And could you maybe go over that one more time or rephrase yeah, it? Yeah, sorry, I didn't actually. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, that second bullet point. Right. Um, let me see is the best way to do that. So assuming that uh, you have 22 questions, just like this, we have to. Um, and you, you use the same model to handle each question. So that basically each layer here is the model to handle one question. Uh -huh. And remember that essentially all the models are doing here is really just have some kind of vector representation for your context, right? Mm -hmm. And then usually that kind of thing is um, I don't know, bias DM, so you have layer like, like this, then you have a, a new kind of bias DM output, and then you actually push it to another layer, so you have these five layers. Um, so this part this layer is the first question. Okay. So the idea is that when you, when you are dealing with the second question, uh -huh. and then you essentially have the same size of your context uh, vector and then also internal representation, because the, you are using the same dots, the same length. Now, the addition, the, the, the idea here is that you want to kind of not only just pass the information of these tokens embedding to this surrounding uh, when you handle this question, but you also want to push it to the next question. And then remember that there are actually not just two questions behind you have to the question. So it's kind of like you can push it to all the RNF questions. That. Um, so that, that's what we mean by um, having another RN, the, the, the token label. Um, thing. Uh, so it's kind of like you have now have a 3D, which 2D is what the model you handle one question because it's network, so you have different layers. But then you also have kind of vertical things that you push the embedding to the power function. Okay. So in that case, that when you're dealing with uh, um, Five questions, or so, then you not just get the um, answers of two various questions, you also get the internal processing units uh, of the previous uh, question. So essentially, you are actually you are kind of trying to use much more information from other questions. So is it the, the hidden state? Is it con is connected of the previous yes. answer? Or, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.